remember in January, I didn't even know what data science was. And in December, I think, or at least the next January, I was teaching it. You don't need the greatest expert in something to teach you. What you need is someone who's recently been there and is a few steps ahead. I was learning days to weeks to months in advance of what my students were learning. And that's one reason I was an effective teacher. I could remember how hard it was to learn a certain concept. The closer you are to that experience of, oh yeah, I remember what it was like. And it it, it both influences um, the amount of empathy you bring to the teaching, but also allows you better insight into how to get someone to have that same insight. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Kevin Markham. Kevin is the founder of Data School, an online school that helps you learn data science. In the past eight years, he's taught more than a million students in the classroom and online. He's passionate about teaching people who are new to data science, and he's known for taking complex topics and breaking them down into easy to understand lessons. He has a degree in computer engineering from Vanderbilt University, and he lives in Asheville, North Carolina with his wife and son. In today's episode, we learn how Kevin found his superpower in teaching, how he embodies the saying, not all who wander are lost, and how he found motivation and creative energy through self-work and introspection when he was going through a difficult time. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do as well. Enjoy. So, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I uh, I came came about your your content on YouTube, obviously through through Data School, which has been a great learning resource for myself and so many other people. And I'm just really excited to have you in today to learn about your story, learn about uh, how you're able to build such a successful education platform, and also just a little bit more about you and and uh, and your background and some of the things that that you've worked through. So welcome. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me, Ken. I, I think this is gonna be great. I'm really excited. And uh, you've been doing some great content. I've been uh, a lot of my YouTube stuff is is years old, but you have been putting out a lot. And I really respect that. Thank you. Well, um, you know, it's one of the very beautiful things about YouTube is that if you produce good content, yes, it's evergreen, yes. right? And that's something yes. that I I really think is important for people to remember is if you do good yep. work, it really does carry over for a long period of time. People don't just forget. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get recommended your videos all the time still, <laughs> you know, and I'm, you know, I'm probably at a different learning stage from most right. people, but that that's one of the beautiful things about sort of the world we live in. But yeah. Uh, to kick things off, sure. I'd love to learn about your story. Where did you first get interested in data? You know, was there a pivotal moment that happened or was it more of a slow progression over time? Right, right. So um, so I graduated from Vanderbilt University uh, with a degree in computer engineering, which is basically uh, computer science and electrical engineering back in 2002 and kind of took quite a winding path to get here. So I was in AmeriCorps for a couple of years, um, and I used to work for the Forest Service as a wildland firefighter. Um, so nothing having to do with data. And uh, and I think when I graduated, I don't think data science was. I mean, I know it wasn't like a major, and I don't know if if people even knew the term or used the term, but. Um, and then I was in, you know, the nonprofit space for a while. I lived in DC for quite a few years. And uh, yeah, so none of this was hot. Some of it was technical. Some of it was programming. Um, but uh, for the most part, it was, well, it was really all over the map what I was working on. Um, but it was stuff I was passionate about and I was just kind of following my path. And then um, I helped start a startup company back in I think 2012 or 2013 I guess 2012 and um, ultimately that uh, did not work out and at the end of 2013 um, and this will lead into the the data piece but at the end of 2013 I was taking all of us on the team were taking a pause to kind of 
figure out what would happen next. And that was when um, I re- I still remember I got this email from General Assembly, which is this um, company that does a lot of tech education. So they do like data science education, data analysis, um, digital marketing, um, maybe some business, UX, UI stuff. So all kinds of like professional education, if you will, at their their campuses. And I got, I signed up for some sort of contest um, on their website or something. And then, so I got on their mailing list and they sent me this email and this is the beginning of 2014. And the email said like, you know, we're doing this new data science course. And I was like, what is data science? I have not heard this term. And I looked into it and I thought, oh, this looks, this looks great. Like it looks like a really natural fit for my skill set and for my educational background. And I was like, I want to learn more. And they were advertising their, um, a part-time data science course. So, um, you know, this is January and I'm like, yes, I'm in, I want to do this. And it's in DC, um, where I was living and, um, yeah. And while it was going to be a couple months before it started, and this happened to be the time when I don't know how, I can't remember when like Coursera and, and MOOC started massively open online courses. Um, but 2014 January was actually the first time Johns Hopkins ran their first data science specialization. Um, and people might know like Roger Pang and Jeff Leak if you're big in the R world. So they were running, the, uh, and Brian Caffo, I think, they were running this for the very first time. And it was perfect timing. I was like, oh, well, I've got two months before this General Assembly course starts, and they're doing this new specialization. And I was like, I'm not working because I had just stopped doing the startup thing. So I was like, I am just going to take this, um, this MOOC super seriously. And so I would take multiple courses at once. I would hang it on the forums. I was doing all the homeworks. Um, and there was this other course that was also being run for the first time. And people listening might know um, the famous uh, Hasty and Tip Shirani book, Intro- An Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in R, and it's called ISLRs, how people call it. And they were running their, I think their first online course based upon their book. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this too. So I kind of just turned myself into a full-time student. And f- between the Johns Hopkins um, course and uh the ISLR course I was like I was learning a ton really really quickly and really enjoying it and that book um ISLR is just a masterpiece that I've read a number of times and has had a big impact on me and so that's all to say and I can I can talk more about where it headed from here but that's all to say that like my introduction to data was not like I came in saying like, I want to work with data. How can I do it? It was, oh, there's this field. I, it looks like a direction that would be great for me. And why not? Like, let's go all in on this and study and just treat it like a essentially almost free uh, master's program of my own is, is what I might call it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got started and just really loved, um, the process that we were learning and like the programming and and all of it just kind of fit well with like how I like to problem solve and, um, gathering insights and, and investigating like that all kind of fit with my interests. So that was like my, my introduction to, uh, kind of data science. So I, I love that so much. I find that <laughs> so many people that I talk to, yeah. they find the field and just a light bulb goes off. And they're right. like, wow, I, I get this. And right. I, I, I'd have to look at the data from my past episodes, but I have to imagine there's a pretty large contingent of people that just sort of wandered before, right? right. I think naturally data science 
is pretty complementary if you're exploratory or you're curious, but right. you also don't necessarily want to be tied down to one thing. <laughs> yes. I, know, I know that's how I was. I mean, I, in my overarching career, mm-hmm. I tried to do as many things that were generalizable as possible because I didn't really know what I wanted the end goal to be. Mm-hmm. And obviously there were things that I was passionate about in the way right. and, and, and in the interim, but it wasn't like, oh, I see this huge vision that's out there. And then I found data science and I was like, wow, this field gives me the tools to explore anything that I want. I feel like mm-hmm. the world is at my fingertips because it's applicable to so many different domains. If there is something that I really fall in love with, obviously we both are in love with education and mm-hmm. and trying to help people to learn technical skills, help further their career. I can apply the data skill set to that, or I could apply it to sports, which is what my normal like main nine to five job is. So I, I it it surprises me every time and it really shouldn't how generalizable this is, right. but also how many people can can make it their own. There's so many segments and pockets within the domain as well that I would imagine most people who are inclined and have sort of that affect about them or they are curious will be able to find almost exactly what they're looking for within the broader field. And I, right. I, I mean, haven't seen, yeah, I haven't seen too many other fields that are like that. Yeah. I mean, like, so data science really benefits from domain knowledge and it's, you know, and people come from all kind of different domains. And when you know the domain, you are much better working as a data scientist in that domain, which is why, you know, of of course, people can train to be a data scientist and then find the domain or find the company and 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 learn how to work with their data. There's also a lot of folks who, you know, they start in an industry, they discover um, that they want to get those insights from the data. They want to learn how to work better with data. And that's a lot of the students at General Assembly. Um, and they, they actually, their goal is not, quote, become a data scientist. They might. But a lot of them, it's just like, I love my my field or I love this job or whatever, this company. And they just bring those skills to their existing career, um, which is why the title is is funny because a lot of people are already in some domain and it would be weird to be like, can I be the data scientist? Well, you're doing the same thing a data scientist does um, or not that there's like one thing a data scientist does, but um, you're really just like solving problems with data in your particular niche. And you don't have to do that full time as a quote data scientist to deliver enormous value, um, you know, doing that process. So, yeah, I mean, that that's 100% how I personally stumbled on the field right. is that I yeah. was doing analysis on sports, trying to improve my own performance, trying to win like like DraftKings game. Oh, okay, yes. And I kept going down this rabbit <laughs> hole of how do I, what is a model? How do I build a uh-huh. model? I hear people talking about these right. things. What does that look like? Is it is it regression? Is that what a model is? But right. that doesn't really help me. You know, maybe I can predict outcomes, but it kept, you know, it, right. it's a, one more layer, one more layer, one more layer. And then I got so into it, I was like, well, I might as well go back to school and just learn this. I'm right. I'm, I'm, I've learned some of the skill set already. Um, yeah. I, I'm interested. So you took all like the MOOCs, you took right. a lot of these courses before yep. you even did General Assembly. Right. right. Was General Assembly worth it? What what was Yeah, your yeah, it was that? I mean, it was um it was great for me. Like, you know, every uh every course, every instructor's different. Um they try to have a standard curriculum, but for for a given topic, but it was awesome for me. Um so I was still during General Assembly during my course, it was 11 weeks, um, just six hours a week uh, in the evenings. And so during the day, I was like doing the homeworks and I was still doing the online courses. I was actually, for the data science specialization, I started being one of their online TAs. So I was just like, I am going to take all my time and get better at this stuff. Um, And by the end of the you know, and of course, so coming into the course, having done a lot of studying of it, I was like, okay, I already know some of this, but my instructor was great and I learned a lot of new things. Um, and at this time I was working pretty much all in R. 
but um, we did a little bit of Python in the course, but I was more comfortable with R. And then at the end of the course, they um, they were looking for teaching assistance for the next iteration of it, which was just, I think, a couple weeks later. And they asked me, and I was like, uh, am I ready for this? And my my um, girlfriend, now wife, was like, oh, yeah, 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 you, you can do this. Like, you're ready, you, you know? And I was like, okay. So um, I was actually a teaching assistant for the next time they were in the course. And then at the end of that, they were looking for instructors and asked me to co-instruct the course. And I was like, whoa, uh, are you sure? Like, and there, my wife is like, yes, do it. And they're like, yeah, you'd be great. Like, this will work. And, you know, they paired me with someone else. And, and um, you know, so this is the end of 2014. And remember, in January, I didn't even know what data science was. And in December, I think, or at least the next January, I was teaching it. And it turned out I loved, I love teaching. Like, I did not, you know, my mom's a teacher, actually, but I did not grow up thinking I want to be a teacher. And I, it turned out, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm good at teaching. Like, this is, this is fun. Like, you know, and these classes are three hours long. So me and my um, co-instructor, we would just take turns. um, And so I'd be up there for like three hours and it was great. Like I, I couldn't have even predicted that. I mean, I did looking back, I did some teaching at my, like, um, at one of the nonprofits I worked for, I would hold these little training sessions on Excel and like V lookups and whatever, you know, and I enjoyed that. So maybe that was a predictor of something to come, but, um, yeah, I started teaching and just fell in love with teaching. And I ended up teaching that course the next year. So in 2015, I taught it like, let's see, one, two, like five times, I think, and ended up becoming like their, you know, their lead data science instructor for that campus. And I started onboarding new instructors and whatever. So um, it just, it was like, you know, I feel so lucky for the folks that believed in me. And I learned so much because as you probably know, like when you teach, you have to learn. You like exposed, you, yeah. yeah. Um, so I very much ta- learned. Um, I learned so much because, you know, again, at General Assembly, most people are like, I work in the field and I'm teaching in the evenings. Me, I'm like, I have no other job. I'm going to spend all my time learning, getting better at teaching. I was blogging. Um, I was creating YouTube videos already. Um, And there's kind of a funny story to why I started that. But um, I was like spending all my time both learning data science, um, learning how to teach better. I was rewriting lessons that I didn't like. Um, and I ended up rewriting probably 90% of the lessons. And so I was just like teaching my own material by the end of 2015, because like, I was like, oh, I can teach this better. And I had the time, you know, during the day when I'm not teaching, I was like, I can rewrite these materials how I want them. And you just learn so much when you are responsible for teaching something and you, you know, you put that, that pressure on yourself to like, I want to give these students a great experience. I'm, I want to be able to answer their questions and guide them through this, you know, really complicated field. Um, so that was really the start of, you know, data school. It was just, you know, the data school blog has been since 2014 and it was just me sharing what I was learning and writing blog posts on topics that there weren't at the time good blog posts on. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, so that that was kind of like how I got into teaching and how data school started, um, just kind of an accident. <laughs> I'd like to take a quick second to thank one of our sponsors, PathRise. Job hunting can be daunting, particularly in today's unpredictable world. PathRise matches you with a dedicated mentor in your field to provide tailored support throughout your job search journey. From optimizing your resume and application process to mastering your interview skills, their expert guidance prepares you to secure your dream job 
and to negotiate a competitive salary. The cherry on top is that you don't pay until you secure that high paying job that you've been aiming for. Don't hesitate, visit pathrise.com slash Kenji to get matched with an expert mentor today. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade, line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2, and they can be configured with the data science software stack manager. With the software stack manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. That story is so fascinating to me. So I, I really respect and I kind of admire what how you approach that situation. So to me, I find that education is inherently flawed, especially in universities, because a lot of the time the professors they just want to do their research and they don't really care about being the best teacher they mm -hmm. can be. They don't care about being as useful to the students as they could possibly be. Of course, there are some anomalies. And I, I think that that's probably true for general assembly, boot camps, any of the type of content out mm -hmm. there. But I think it's so cool that you were so committed and focused on not just becoming a better data scientist, learning the domain and those types of things, but you were also focused on becoming a better teacher and making things more accessible. I think that from a pure education perspective, we need so many more of those people because the incentive system isn't necessarily structured in higher education to encourage the best and most efficient teaching. I mean, right. we talked a little offline about how I think AI is completely transforming a lot of teaching mm -hmm. because now we have this ability to individualize or personalize and mm -hmm. have immediate feedback when you know, a classroom of 200 people, you have one professor, or maybe a couple TAs, but is that really enough? Or are the students too intimidated to talk to that person? Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I love that concept. I also think that there's maybe a, a deeper life lesson in here about <laughs> the end and the means, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes like you were probably going to general assembly to just learn. And it's like, hey, maybe I'll get a job in this field right. after I just want right. to learn. And instead, it actually became the end in some right. sense. Right. Right. You went exactly. in with like, oh, this is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And then this is actually the end. The teaching for me, mm -hmm. I love this. You fall in love with the process. Yep. And I think a lot of the time we don't focus and analyze the means that we're taking. Mm -hmm. And we real we don't realize that we're missing things that we really enjoy. Mm -hmm. You know, YouTube, when I first started it, it was an ends to a mean. A, a means to an end, sorry, where it was, um, you know, I was looking to improve the way I communicate. I was looking mm -hmm. to, to like build my brand to tell better stories. And through the YouTube and through podcasts, I just fell in love with creating content. I fell in love with right. telling stories. I fell in love with the whole process. And I'd probably make YouTube videos if I didn't make any money from it, if I right. didn't get any of these things. I mean, All I right. make less now because I just have less time than <laughs> other things I enjoy. Yes. But, you know, it, it, I think that if we sort of don't walk through the forest, don't look at the trees, we really might miss something that we love that we could even make a career out of. Yeah. And to me, that's that's like sad is there's probably something that so many listeners have overlooked because they're like, oh, I'm just doing this to do this mm -hmm. when they really could have enjoyed just that first thing. Right. And, and there's a couple points I want to pull out of that. Um, one is um, I think that in terms of really effective teaching, um, you know, and, and lots of people, this is not an original insight, lots of people have said this, but a lot of times you don't need the greatest expert in something to teach you. What you need is someone who's recently been there and is a few steps ahead. And I was the, yes. the absolute example of that. Um, I was learning like, you know, days to weeks to months in advance of what my students were learning. And that's one reason I was an effective teacher. I could remember how hard it was to learn a certain concept because once something clicks, it can be hard to remember why it was hard for it to click because it just clicks. And you're like, I just get that. And 
the closer you are to that experience of, oh yeah, I remember what it was like. And it 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 both influences um, the amount of empathy you bring to the teaching, but also allows you um, better insight into how to get someone to have that same insight. Um, so that was, you know, I've always felt that way about, you know, my teaching that like being, you know, there are lots, you know, I teach mostly Python these days. And I have a lot of peers who are way better at Python than me. They know so much more. Um, and But I'm still an effective teacher for beginner Python and intermediate Python. I don't teach advanced Python. I need to learn more if I need to. I, I, would, I enjoy learning more of that. And as I need it for projects and whatnot, I will learn more advanced Python. But, you know, you don't need to be that massive expert you just need to be a few few steps ahead um so that you know uh, that was something i i found from my own experience um there was something else i wanted to pull out of there um oh about content creation that um yeah i mean i was uh as i was teaching not only was i doing all of, um, you know, I was doing courses, I was taking courses, I was teaching my course, I was rebuilding lessons, and I was building content. And at the time, like I, my first YouTube video, um, again, in 2014, was about Git. And that's because the first course in the data science specialization was about Git and GitHub. And I was in the forum, I was a TA, and people were really confused. And I was like, Oh, I didn't think this course was taught very well. So I made a video series um, that taught Git and GitHub and essentially walked people through, you know, all the skills they needed to do the assignments in the course. And so that's why I created those videos, because I was like, the course was not good. Uh, you know, no offense to the, the people who created it. It just, it didn't, it, it was... It just was missing like that feeling of I just learned this, like let me let me take you along the path. Um, it was just like here's some facts, here's some facts, and you'll see how it fits together. And it it didn't for a lot of people. So I made those videos and I I was making videos to support some of my classroom instruction. Like I'd be like, okay, we're, you know, I don't have time to really um Oh, actually, I would give it as like pre-work. So it'd be like, okay, our, our next class is on Thursday. Before then, watch this video I made about the ROC curve, which is one of my most popular videos because it's just a tough concept. And I, I came up with some good visuals and it's just like I was building content because I needed, I, I wasn't finding the like really sharp content that I wanted for my students. Um, and so that's what I was, you know, doing, uh, and it was awesome. Um, really, you know, I mean, and that's why I started data school. It wasn't like, you know, the URL was just actually, a an, not an accident, but I, I knew I had to make a blog and I can't remember what I was originally going to call it, but that URL was not available. And so me and my wife or my now wife, we were we were talking about like, okay, what should, you know, what are some ideas? And, and I think she came up with data school and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. And I bought that data school.io. And then I was like, well, it's called a school. So I better teach something. Cause this is even before I had the, the teaching job, but you know, I just loved communicating those concepts and, um, just sharing what I was learning. So that was, that was awesome. Um, uh, and, and I did want to throw out one more kind of insight I, I, um, from what you were saying is a, a privilege that I had is that I wasn't working uh, full time. Like I didn't have a day job. So it was a huge privilege that, you know, for 2014, 2015, yes, I was working a lot. I was working in the evenings and I was doing a lot in terms of building lessons and stuff and being a TA online, but I had the daytime to create this content and really focus on the craft of teaching. And that is, you know, I don't take lightly that how lucky I was that, you know, I'd been working for a number of years and a part-time uh, teaching, uh, sorry, 
a um, instructor general assembly is not intended to be a full-time salary. It is not even close. Um, so that's why most people do it as like a, a side thing. But I was like, well, this, I love this. This is going somewhere. Like I can see it. Like this is working. I've got to follow this and it's all going to work out. And again, that's, that is privilege to have that, um, that opportunity. Um, but, uh, yeah, it really, it really helped a lot cause I built a lot of content in those years. So, well, you know, this ties into one of my favorite concepts of all time, you know, and it's economy of uh, scope. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people talk about economies of scale. If you, if you do one thing and you do it a bunch, you get cost savings, but okay. economies of scope means that if you, I'm sure you know what it means, but for, for those listening that don't economies of scope is that if you're working on one thing, it's also easier for you to create things that are just slightly different from it, mm. but related. And mm -hmm. those things all tie together. So, you know, you were mm. teaching a course and you're making blog content, probably right. off the same thing you were, you were teaching. Right. You were also making YouTube content, which you could right. probably use the blog content as a script or whatever that might be. And that isn't just unique to creating content and education. It's, mm -hmm. hey, I'm taking this course online, doing it part time. How can I apply this to my job? How right. can I leverage these skills or these tools to make what I'm doing better? I mean, you get paid for that. You're essentially mm -hmm. getting paid to learn right. and use these tools. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, yes, absolutely. I, I did something very similar where I went back to school because I wanted to start a business and I wanted, I was essentially like taking out loans to buy time to be able to really invest in that. The business mm -hmm. did not succeed. I did get a degree and I have a lot of <laughs> debt, but you know, I, it was like a conscious decision that I was, that I was, okay, I'm doing this to buy time for me to, to really focus mm -hmm. on learning and building out a skill set. And, you know, fortunately that paid off for me. I mean, it right. doesn't, I think pay off for everyone that, that approaches it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but but to me that that overarching concept of scope is something that so many people overlook. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. I, you know, if I'm doing this and I also do that, it's double the work and this what this and whatnot. But it really mm -hmm. isn't double the work. It's maybe like mm -hmm. one point one five times the work, mm -hmm. and you get two x the output. To me, that is that is one of the keys to efficiency and time and production. Is hey, all the things that I'm working on are running a little bit parallel. Mm -hmm. from doing five things, it takes me maybe twice the time, but I get five X the output. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something I think you embodied so well, especially during that, that period of your life, right. which is amazing. Well, thank you. That's, that's nice of you to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was like my most productive <laughs> period, I think. I mean, in some senses, like I was creating so much and it's like, you know, it was all I was doing. And then, uh, and then data school kind of to, to take, take, uh, folks along the data school story, essentially, like I stopped, um, for the most part doing in-person instruction and started, um, you know, from the blog and the, and the videos, which I had no concept of, um, at least that I can remember that I need to build a personal brand. It was more like. I am putting things out and people are finding me and I'm like, oh, this is good. This seems like it's going to help. Um, and uh, at some point, I just like put up a newsletter sign up form and I didn't send any newsletters, but I was like, well, I got to capture email addresses. And then um, at some point, I just, uh, I think this is late 2015, I taught my first online course um, that... Uh, yeah, it was completely separate from general assembly. It was just like, here's something I want to teach. I've got an email list. I've got people who know me now and, and I'm going to teach something. And that went well. And that, and basically since then I've been kind of full time or at least not working on anything else, um, than data school. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that was, that was 2015. And then, 2016, I got married. I had I had a child, and life changes when when there's more folks in the equation, and uh, so um, like many many parents, new parents especially, my productive output was was less and yeah. well, your priorities <laughs> probably change, right. <laughs> I, but I I think that, that that to me that's something that I really focus on is. Uh -huh. 
I can spend a lot of time doing work I enjoy up front mm-hmm. and I can see dividends or compounding returns from that mm-hmm. over time. I mean, this is right. a concept I've been wrestling with for the last couple of months is that time I put in now is actually worth more than time that I put in in the future mm-hmm. because the things I do now have the power to compound compared to what I do in the future. And like, you know, there's some things that I find real enjoyment in and I feel like I really need to do those things, you know, going out in nature, exploring, mm-hmm. you know, like, like things that will leave a tangible impact on me versus things like social media. Like, have I, am I ever going to remember <laughs> an Instagram post that I looked right. at? It's just randomly scrolling. Probably not. But right. those hours, it's the same amount of time. You know, I go for an hour hike versus I scroll Instagram for an hour, but the returns on that time are very different. You know, mm-hmm. like one gives me more peace of mind, clarity, whatever it is. Or if I even put an hour of that time into my business, that could make me, in theory, like millions of dollars in the future because I, you know, fix something or produce some form of content or whatever right. it might be. And there's nothing, in my opinion, more powerful to see that than producing content because you never know what's going right. to be successful. You never know what, what could happen. And um, obviously, this compounds in other places. Like maybe there's something that you learn while studying or while listening to a podcast that completely changes your life. And I think Mm -hmm. for the most part, maybe I'm very biased. Oh, actually I am very (laughs) biased. I think podcasts are good uses of your time, Um, but, but no, maybe there's something you hear that like just clicks and you're like, wow, Mm -hmm. that compounds for the rest of my life. I, I learned this thing and now I have that lesson to fall back on forever. Or you learn a, a, you know, some, coding trick or you learn some algorithm that in your next interview it helps you pay off and you wouldn't have gotten that interview if or you wouldn't have landed that job if you didn't answer that interview question effectively or hold your poise or whatever Mm -hmm. it is around that and so that could change the course of your life and compound going forward and you know this isn't to say every minute counts and you have to be like you know with your time when you're younger but to me i i look back and essentially the only regret that i have is like wow some of these times where I just wasted it, I wish I had spent it doing mm-hmm. something that was either meaningful or productive. Right. And, you know, like some things like, you know, going out with my friends and, you know, like having beers or whatever it is and and having a good time. Some of those are meaningful because I you cultivated worthwhile relationships, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. But there's also times you're like, well, I drank too much. I didn't remember. That was literally <laughs> a waste of an entire <laughs> evening that I could have been doing. Or the next day that you wasted, right? And so, you know, it, I, moving forward, I'm really focusing on like, okay, how do I spend my time in a way that that I would be proud of when I look back? And I imagine mm-hmm. you have some similar thoughts, especially, you know, you have a child. It's like, well, yeah, I want to spend yeah. time with my kid, right? I want to do that as right. effectively as possible. Um. Yeah, so a bit on, um, you know, like I've been doing data school for nine years, almost nine years now. I think as of five days from now will be nine years since my first video. And like in some ways I look back and I'm like, oh, I haven't I haven't accomplished enough for nine years. But at the same time, like I've really enjoyed it. Um and I have, you know, I've got some great content that I've I've put. I mean, I've put out a lot of great content. Um, I feel really proud of it. I continue to create new stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, like you said, the old the older stuff continues to pay returns, um, huge returns uh, in in continuing to move the business forward, even when you know I'm not putting out a new piece of content every day or or whatever. But um, yeah. The other part of it is the skills that I've built over these nine years. I feel like, you know, I happen to love, you know, business, running a business. It's just me. And uh, yeah, those skills I, I can continue to use. And it, it actually doesn't matter like, well, how long did it take me to get where I am? Doesn't matter. Here I am. You know, I'm 42 and I'm like, all right, well, I got I got plenty of time left and I am going to keep working on data school as long as I'm passionate about it. And I've got, you know, after a couple um, rougher years, I've got like so much energy in 2023 for data school. And I've been kind of on fire, at least 
internally, like, you know, people who follow me can't necessarily see all of it, but I've got so much I'm creating and so many like half done things that I can't wait to finish and put out in the world. And, uh, I've just got like a lot of creative fire going on right now. Um, so So it's, it's great. What's the fuel for that creative fire? I mean, I, I find myself, I, I like go through valleys and and peaks yeah and i'm always interested in what is motivating to people or what is pushing them forward so i can know great question yeah um you know and there have been times and, and it's hard to know how objective i was feeling at any given time about the business but there were times when you know i was having a rough time and i was like oh maybe i'm doing the wrong thing do i need to i would ask my my wife like do I need to do do something else? Like, is this is that the problem? And no, data school is never the problem. Um, I think like you you might find um, that most things in life are not about um, whatever you're blaming it on is not kind of the underlying problem, um, and it's mostly about just kind of working on yourself and um, and your your own development and your relationship with things, but. I just have so much that I want to teach and share with the world. And like over time, I've built, you know, as I said, I've built like some half courses that I haven't released. And I'm like, oh, no, this needs to go out in the world. So um, a lot of it is there are so many things that I want to be taught kind of my way and there, you know, no one's me except me. Um, and I'm not necessarily the right teacher for everyone. Of course, I'm the right teacher for some people. But for those people, I want to teach them like everything I can. You know, if someone wants to learn from me and really likes my style, I want to, I want to teach like I have a I have a a course that's it's written, it's on Conda and, you know, it's like, you know, Conda for, for package um, management, management and environment yeah. management. And it's so important. And it's, it's like, it's a great course and no one's seen it because I haven't finished it. And I just really like want that course to be out in the world. And I have like, you know, I released a Python course a couple of years ago and I've got the next module built for that. And but it's not like finished, but it's so good. And I can't wait to like put it out in the world. And the machine learning course that I've been building for literally a couple of years, it's, um, you know, it's 60,000. I wrote the script first and it's 60, I think 60,000 words long. And I've recorded almost two thirds of it. And it is an awesome course. I mean, like I, I would have loved this to have this course because it's distilling, you know, a lot of what I teach these days is is supervised machine learning. And it is distilled so much of what I've learned over, you know, nine years about machine learning and all the insights I've gotten packaged into the, you know, the format that I really like, and I just haven't gotten it finished. So there may be some time at which like I've, put out everything I need to in the world and the fire will be gone. But quite frankly, like I've got years worth of content already in my mind or in draft form to put out, not to mention everything I'm going to want to put out once I set aside more time to just keep learning. Um, Because one of the things I, I don't have a lot of is just, I mean, I can make more time, but just time to sit and and learn new skills. So, um, that's probably my biggest, um, I don't know. Weakness is I haven't, like, I don't, I, if I spent half my week learning new things, that would be great. It would just mean my content went out even slower. Um, but you know, like just yesterday I was working on building a dashboard with shiny and, uh, plotly, and I had never used plotly and I had, um, shiny, I had used the R version, but the Python version is new for building dashboards and it's awesome. It was a lot of fun. And I was like, oh, maybe I should build a course on shiny, but that's like months of work. And I've got so many other things. So it's, um, the, the fire burns bright, uh, right now. And I hope for many years to come. Um, as I said, like I had some 
a more like a lot of people pandemic time was 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 greater stress and exposed some of the um i was thinking about a metaphor today about um houses and how um you know even a a a house without like a really solid foundation is great when there's no stress like when it's not stressed by like let's say weather or whatever but you know, you have an earthquake, um, suddenly the foundation, you know, the house that's on the great foundation is fine. And the shaky one, well, you see the cracks. And I think my past, um, you know, my past couple of years, besides just being busy as a parent, um, you know, me and my wife, we have our child at home until he was, well, until he was three and then we started school and then the pandemic hit and then he's back with us. So, um, you know, essentially till he was four, he was with us full time um, outside of some family help and babysitters and whatnot, which was which was awesome. But um, yeah, like that was a time of uh, like a lot of extra stress and those cracks started to come um, during the past couple of years. And thankfully I have kind of really, um, I don't want to say moved past anything that that's like, yeah, that doesn't match with my experience of being human, but like I've developed a ton in a way that allows me to be more effective, certainly more effective at work, but effective in all areas, like with my, as a husband and as a, as a father. And so that's ultimately why my, I've got so much fire right now and energy and I'm putting out good stuff is because, you know, the last couple of years were tough and I really put in the work to kind of, um, develop myself, you know, uh, do kind of the inner work and the outer work, um, to kind of, uh, you know, be prepared to, you know, just go forward with, my uh, with the business and, and everything. So people who have followed me for a long time were probably like, huh, a couple of years where you didn't put out much. And I was working a lot behind the scenes on stuff. Um, you know, I have a probably a year where I didn't even put out a single video. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's great to be where I am right now. And um, yeah, as, as you, you, as you reflected, I've got a lot of fire for it. Yeah. So, how does someone, you know, start to make that turnaround? I know a lot of people during the pandemic, you know, a, a lot of people went into a, a fairly dark place. It, right. You know, the, the world was in a pretty bad place. I mean, now even we have a lot of tech layoffs. There's a lot of mm -hmm. uncertainty about the job market. I get more messages than ever about people saying, hey, is it even worth it to learn technical skills or domain is mm -hmm. AI going to take these jobs, whatever it might be. I don't think that that makes a very friendly and positive, uh, <laughs> like psychological environment for a lot of right. people. And yeah. you know, how do we, what steps can people take or like start to take to maybe get past a lot of that fear and doubt? I mean, I know right. I'm personally wrestling with a lot of that right now. I like, right. I, I've never been less certain about about the future, mm. um, not necessarily my own future. I generally have like, uh, like a internal locus of control about that. Mm -hmm. But globally, and a lot of these things, it sort of bleeds into into your own sense of self as well, right? Right, right. I mean, yeah. Gosh, you know, part of the so for me, I didn't realize you know, to my, uh, um, metaphor about, uh, foundations, I didn't realize how, I didn't realize the cracks in the foundation until there was a lot of stress. So pandemic, young child, like adjusting from being a person, just doing my own thing to, you know, being a family. I mean, it's a transition, like as I think almost any parent could tell you, like it is a transition and um, it exposed some of the cracks. And, you know, I definitely turned inward in the sense of, you know, I really believe you can't, um, you can't be great at your work and great at taking care of yourself and your family unless you're focused inward first and doing that inner work. And that's all to say that like, 
tuning out, um, tuning out the outside world to the extent that you need to, because it's so important. Like I can't be great at anything if I'm not kind of centered, present, if I'm not feeling comfortable here, if I'm feeling anxious and amped up, like, and not, I don't mean amped in like a good way, but like in a kind of jittery way, that's not when you're going to be your best, uh, best as a parent or anything. Um, I was thinking the other day, this, this might sound super silly, but like, you know, um, would you rather a, if you were going in, let's say to surgery, like, would you rather have a surgeon that just came from like meditating and like ha- is like really, really calm or someone who's really stressed out? And of course, you someone's working on your body. You want someone, um, you want headspace. someone that's really like deeply like calm, peaceful, present. And I think any job, I mean, that's kind of the extreme example, but any any job, whether it's an actual job or the job of being a parent or a friend or anything, benefits from that kind of centered, connected self. So that is all to say that like when I talk about inner work, it's things like, um, you know, asking yourself like, why are you here? That deeper meaning, that spirituality. Um, it is about building relationships. Um, it's about... Uh, you know, getting better sleep, getting exercise, eating better, like really like investing in yourself. Um, Therapy, that's another thing that's been, you know, huge for me is like, um, you know, and it's everyone needs different things. And part of the, um, the cracks forming the foundation during the pandemic, part of that um, exposed like where the cracks were. And like for me, for instance, and there are probably lots of folks like this, where you don't realize how much of a crutch it is just um, having like control of your day. Like, you know, there are some folks that um, probably can identify as really struggling as a parent because you're not used to kind of being the ultimate inflexibility. Um, Now, other people who are very like, I don't, you know, type A, type B, I don't know how appropriate those labels are, but if you picture a type B person that's just kind of like, can kind of roll with things, I think probably would tend to have an easier adjustment to parenting because parenting really does ask for flexibility, um, like you would not believe. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of shocking the amount of responsibility you have as a parent and the amount of unknowns, like you really don't know what is the right decision and you're constantly like going through different phases with with your child and um so much but um anyway i i wasn't aware of how much of an issue that was for me needing to have things kind of my way i didn't realize that that was a big um, crutch for me until it was taken away taken away i chose it until it was no longer easily available in the context of a family where you, you know, you want to be loving to your partner and your child and give them so much. And part of that means putting yourself second. And um, if you're not used to that, and that's not, um, it, it can, it can really be a shock to the system. So that kind of, those cracks kind of helped me to see where I was weak. Um, and, and maybe weak is, is, is too harsh a term, more like underdeveloped. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a journey of, of investing in those basic things, sleep and exercise and relationships and being in nature and getting in touch with my body and learning more about, um, myself uh, and therapy and all those things, you know, everyone will find out for themselves um, under those periods of stress, like where they could use some some more development. And yeah. um, my wife and I are are just huge believers in um, investing in yourself and in developing yourself is what pays the biggest returns in all your relationships. So I know that kind of 
Well, <laughs> no, no, honestly, that was amazing. <laughs> to, to, to me, there's something that that really hit home because, okay. you know, we're we're both business owners, right? right? We both we both have things that oh, it, it this way works the best for me, and I need to do it this way because no one else is telling me what to do. Like mm-hmm. when you run a business, you have complete autonomy and control over it. And it probably won't function if there are too many cooks in the kitchen mm-hmm. or if someone else who's not invested in it is telling you what to do, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then you go to a relationship, which is the opposite. Everything <laughs> is, is, it should be 50-50 where yeah. everything is a conversation. Everything is a, a dialogue. Why are we doing it this way? Okay, um, you know that, you know, you do it this way, I do it this way. Like, is one of us going to change? Is one of us not going to change? I think that there's <laughs> there's something inherently uh, different about how you function in those settings. Mm-hmm. And it took me a ton of re-education for, for anyone I've dated. Now, you're like, I don't even have a kid yet or anything along those lines. So <laughs> to be able to understand, okay, like the way I operate in my business is very different than the way I operate in a relationship. Mm-hmm. And then you now I have businesses where I have partners and those types of things. And it's like, oh, like I'm glad I, I like dated people because I have to pull some of those skills and understanding in to be right. able to navigate those relationships well. Right. And you know, something that that really struck with me, stuck with me with what you were saying is that, you know, you didn't recognize where the cracks in the foundation mm-hmm. were. And I'm a, a huge proponent of like of being in those scenarios, like stressing myself mm-hmm. in like controlled scenarios to see where the cracks are. Right. And that's something in, in everything that I've done is that, okay, like, man, things aren't going well. Uh, but like, I put myself under a little more pressure. I put myself in, you know, difficult scenarios, like an example of this, cause that's not very concrete is like, <laughs> I did a, I, I, I did a jujitsu tournament last weekend. Uh huh. Okay. And it, that, that is scary. You know, you go in, I was, uh, I look and see the other people. They're like, muscular they're like great shape i'm like wow i have to like compete against that guy they're they're trying to rip my arm off i'm trying to (laughs) survive or do whatever and and to me like i am stressing myself like how do i perform what are what are my thoughts like am i doubting myself all these types Mm -hmm. of things when i'm confronted with in some sense actual physical danger Mm -hmm. those are very revealing about a lot of the other areas of my life you know i realized that like my self-talk wasn't as good as I thought it would be. Mm. I I won my first two matches. I won one bracket. And then I go into like the afternoon matches and I, I see the the one of the guys I had already beat. And I ended up losing that match. And I like mm. dominated this guy in the first match. And I was like, oh my goodness, like I completely underestimated this guy in the second session. I just like rested on my laurels. I didn't go in with the right mindset, all of these types of things. And it's like, wow. I learned so much from a day of work, really stressing myself out and and putting myself in that situation mm. that I'm really grateful for. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, do do I do more jujitsu tournaments? Maybe, maybe not. But it's <laughs> things like that where you know you sort of have these crucibles that help you develop those things in in safer settings, right? You never right. want to be in a scenario where it's like, oh, the stakes are really high, and I'm only finding this out now. Right. Um, and you know, that's something that I've only recently learned is like, wow, geez, right. like, you know, uh, it's like, you know, a lot of people, they get a, a dog before they have a kid and it's like, okay, well, maybe that's not like the worst idea because you get a, you get some sense of, okay, how do your partner do this? Like th- there's these little, st- but right. I, I mean, I swear by those types of things because yeah. that's, you know, you don't, you learn a lot about someone else when you have a pet with them. I'm, I'm learning that now. So. Oh yes. I bet. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Actually my wife and I, you know, we have our, our son and, and we're like a pet, like no, besides our allergies, we're like, uh, we've got enough to take care of. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, as any, probably as any parent out there can identify with like parenting being that, that trial by fire where, um, you, uh, yeah, there's certainly value in preparing as best you can and but also recognizing nothing that, can that truly like, prepare you, yeah, it's <laughs> like parenting is like, it's just, um, I was listening to a, um, uh, a, inter- an interview with Andy Weir who write, wrote The Martian and, um, Project Hail Mary, which, um, are two of the few books I've read in 
you know, <laughs> the last six years and were awesome. Anyway, he had a great interview um, and he was talking about his experience of um, becoming a parent and how, you know, the, the, the baby is delivered and then they hand him the child, his, his child. And Andy's like thinking like, uh, do you realize no that I don't know any, like, isn't, isn't this a really bad idea to just give me this child? Like I know what to do. And I remember thinking that same thing, like that first night in the hospital, it was like, uh, wait, you're not going to like stay with, you know, to the nurse. Like, I didn't say this, but you're not like going to stay with us. Like, uh, this is it like us, just the two of us. <laughs> so oh, no. anyway, um, yeah, parenting definitely, definitely trial by fire. Um, cause you really, it's just, it's so hard to even picture. I don't think I did enough, like even thinking about what would be involved in parenting. Like I just, I, I knew I wanted to have a child and, um, and same with my wife and, but I don't, I don't remember spending a lot of time thinking about like, what is it going to be like as a parent? Um, and that, that probably would have been a useful exercise, uh, to help prepare me a bit more. Um, oh, but, uh, well, so anyway. I, th there's, there's one last topic I want to cover, which oh, sure, is sort sure, of sure. related to having a okay. child. So okay. <laughs> a lot of people say that having a business is like having a child, right? Ah. And that, you know, it grows in unexpected ways. You mentioned you love the business side yeah. of, of what you do. And I'm interested yeah. if you could dive into that, you know, like, Sure. What aspects do you like? How do you organize it? You know, right. what's the secret sauce there? Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, so one, you know, kind of tying back to the issue of, you know, liking to kind of be able to control things like it is a solo business and it's, and it's good that, um, for me that I have my hands in all aspects and I can, can kind of design it like I want because it, it is really a space where I get to just make all the decisions and I, I love that. Um, but um, let's see. So the business is always evolving because there's so many possible things I could focus on. I could be, you know, Early on, one might have thought, well, I should be like a full-time YouTuber. And, you know, you can certainly do that. And people are successful doing that. And then I'm like, oh, I, I, I still need to write a lot of blog posts. And I got to have my newsletter. And I've got to be building my following on social media. And all these things and building my courses and figuring out marketing. And so I've kind of bounced around a lot. Um, but I've bounced around enough that I have a good sense of how to be at least decent at all of these things. So I know that the my biggest advantage, you know, in, in entrepreneurship, they talk about your unfair advantage. And, and my unfair advantage is really just teaching um, because that is something I'm, I'm great at, uh, you know. I am, I'm a great teacher and I know that, and I know that I'm a great teacher for some people and not others. And that's, that's perfectly, um, fine. And, um, so my secret sauce is just that I'm great at teaching. And if I can manage to harness that and turn it into actual content, it will be good. So it's all about how do I let go a bit of the, of the perfectionism and put out great content, but not taking forever. So I'm, I'm still working on that. Um, a friend of mine, Ben, who um, is Ben Collins, he's big in the Google Sheets space as a teacher. Um, he has a uh, a weekly newsletter where he shares a tip each week that he's been doing for years. And he encouraged me. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can handle kind of the, the, the cadence of like, you know, regular publishing. It's actually been great because it causes me to put things out in the world every week, really build, practice that muscle of creating and publishing. So I put out the newsletter, it's called Tuesday Tips. But, you know, uh, business is tricky because like, it's, I want to give away a lot. I want my stuff to be really high quality. I want to be really good at marketing it and marketing it and growing a following is how you can use, you can sell things. So it's it's kind of like a lot of juggling um, and I've just had the faith that it'll all pay off in the long term if I just create great stuff, 
um, keep following what I'm passionate about and, um, you know, make those partnerships where they make sense. Um, yeah. So I don't really know where it's going, but I, I love like, you know, it's fun, like, um, running a business and figuring out how to put together a bunch of systems and how to, how to write good emails and do good email marketing and all the tech behind it, like, and Zapier integrations and like, figuring out what parts of your business can automate. Um, so I know that was kind of a quite a, a cloud of thoughts about about business and not not a ton that was concrete. But yeah, my business has always been like ever evolving and it's go ahead, like my guiding principle is go ahead and create the things you're passionate about and trust that the right people will find them and I'll figure out how to make it work as like an actual like business that is, you know, financially uh, making it. Um, and it's it's worked out great. Like, you know, I have my my courses, some free, some paid, and I have Patreon and, you know, ads and I, I license a course to Data Camp and, and stuff like that. So it, it all works out in the end. Um, but courses are where I'm really focused going forward because I think it's where I just drive the most value for my students. So I don't know if that answered anything you were <laughs> you were. No, no, to. That, that was that was beautiful. <laughs> I, I something I really pulled out of that is mm. I, I think for most businesses until they reach a certain size, mm -hmm. it's all about focusing on one vision or one domain. And again, mm -hmm. we revisit my friend Economies of Scope, where it's like, uh -huh. okay, you can pull from these other things. You, you get especially if you're running a business by yourself or you have a really small mm -hmm. team, you want to maximize the output with the least amount of input possible. Mm -hmm. And focusing on the one thing or the few things that really get you 90% of the way and then branching out when you when you really need, need that is super compelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I personally run into that issue where a lot of the stuff that I do, it isn't necessarily completely overlapping. You know, I have YouTube, I have... Uh, the podcast, I have courses, I have uh, some other things. And it's like, well, they're not necessarily tied together. The podcast isn't tied together directly with my YouTube channel. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I do some crossover stuff, but they seem to be almost two different entities. And I have different audiences slightly. And, you know, then I have my normal work and I have right. um, the, the like a like a content agency type thing that I do as well. And it's like, man, all these things I'm not listening. I'm not paying attention to economies of scope like I should be. Like they're all sort of in a similar domain, right? But they're not necessarily close enough together to make them as uh, successful as I think they could be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly reevaluating. Like, should I stop doing things? Should I start right. new things? Should, what should I do? But at the same time, it's also I enjoy all the things that I do, and right. I don't feel like I'm overwhelmed or super stressed by the amount of work that I do. I get a right. little stressed when I travel a ton, and okay. I travel a lot. But when I'm home and I can work on the stuff, I enjoy it all. And That's so it's awesome. like, you know what? You know, maybe my ADD brain is 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 okay with jumping around when I can focus on stuff. But mm -hmm. when um, you know, when there's when those stakes are higher, and I learn a lot, I am putting myself in that type of pressure as well. So I'm right. learning about those cracks in my own personal foundation yeah. too. So. <laughs> Amazing, Kevin. Uh, those are all the questions I have. Awesome. Um, how, how can people learn more about you? Um, you know, how can they find out about the newsletter, these types of things? I'll, I'll link sure. all your links in the description, but sure. awesome. have you say it as well. Yeah, uh, I'd say, I mean, I'll put all my links. Um, we'll make sure all, all those get included. But the key ones, um, dataschool.io is my blog, and that links to everything else. Um, if all, and if so, if you want to just click around and see my stuff, that's one way. Um, if you're like, oh, a newsletter, um, it's, you know, I share a data science tip every week, um, to sign up for that, it's just tuesday.tips. And if you're looking for a course on, um, you know, machine learning or I'll, I'll have one on, um, pandas, uh, at some point, but I've got a couple of different courses, some free, some paid, um, is it courses.dataschool.io. Uh, that's courses plural. So um, those are just some of the places you can find me online. And folks are feel free to. Uh, I'm easy to to reach. So feel free to shoot me an email if you like. Um, Kevin at dataschool.io. So awesome! Great. Thank well, you so much for the time today. Oh, uh, absolutely! Thank you for the time and thanks for all the effort you put into the podcast, Ken. And uh, this was this was a lot of fun. So I appreciate I appreciate you.